Good afternoon. Um, my name is Ken Giller. I'm professor of plant production systems in, in Wageningen University. Uh, you might have seen me already last week uh, talking about uh, crop nutrition. And today I'm going to be debating with uh, Will Masters. Will. Hello, everybody. I'm Will Masters at Tufts University in Boston. I teach at the Friedman School of Nutrition. Uh, and I'm an agricultural economist. I've worked on economics uh, of farm communities and uh, production choices, markets and trade. Um, and you'll be hearing from me in week uh, six, in module six about rural poverty uh, and uh, agriculture as a pathway to uh, escape from poverty, as well as improvements in health and nutrition, which is what I work on mostly now at, at Tufts. So the topic today then that we'll be talking about is uh, we're going to be talking about sustainable intensification and particularly about this different ways of framing and thinking about farming. So the industrial farming or agroecological farming. Yeah, and I was super keen for the chance to talk to Ken. I followed Ken's work uh, as have many people around the world. Um, I think of Ken as sort of the soil whisperer, the nitrogen whisperer about uh, plant uptake of nutrients and, uh, and productivity growth. And Ken had this really interesting book chapter recently uh, asking the question, is this a golden age for agronomy? Uh, and I found the, the framing the question really interesting. Ken, what do you mean by the question? Why, why ask, is this a golden age? So I've been working with quite a group of people about this whole issue of, of uh, uh, how, we, how we frame uh, debates around agriculture. And I, uh, I chose that title for the chapter because I really felt, you know, if we were working all through the 1990s and into early 2000s, we were working in agriculture and working on looking at improving crop yields and everything, and, and nobody really seemed all that interested. But just recently, we really feel as though the spotlight suddenly swung around and to focus right on us. It's like we're in center stage now for many, many debates about farming, the interest in food, the interest in sustainability of food production. and getting interest really from all corners, including a lot from the big companies or NGOs, yeah, many different sides. So suddenly we're in the spotlight. And I get the feeling from the chapter, maybe I'm reading a bit into it, but that some of that spotlight is not necessarily framed in a way that really elucidates, that there's a spotlight that's hiding as much as it's, uh, as much as it's um, illuminating. Is Well, it, it's for me. Yeah, particularly we, we often end up in debates which which you know some people would argue are very sterile. You know, which form of farming is the best? And people using terms like conventional farming. Now, actually, it's never really defined. It's usually defined by the alternative. We're doing this because it's better than conventional farming. Um, and I think that's used very much in in the debates around organic agriculture uh, around. Um, around agroecology, and and I think industrial farming is potentially also one of those terms which is which is very poorly defined, and and I'm not always sure what it is. Yeah, it's a striking thing that agriculture employs roughly half the world's workforce, and almost all of those, ninety five percent of them, are self employed family farmers whether it's a very poor society and those family farmers are poor or a rich society and those family farmers are rich, they're family farmers. But that's only true for certain parts of agriculture, of course. Uh, other parts do industrialize in the sense of having an outside owner own the company and employ salaried workers. So as you think about this, uh, these, these framings, can you say a little bit more about the framings that you find least helpful and maybe the ones that you find most helpful? Are there ways of talking about agronomy in a golden age that, that you really like? But I think this is, you know, this, this is a difficult one, of course. We're all very good at, at criticizing, not so good often at putting forward the, the really good alternative. I was triggered a bit by what you're saying there. I mean, this was also partly one of the reasons we started thinking and talking and writing about this was uh, around the, the year of family farming. When, if you look at the way the FAO used the term family farming in, in their websites and the year of family farming, it was very much framed around family farms are small farms of two hectares or less. When I think that's really not true, because as you were just saying, 
95% or more of farms globally are family farms. And they can range in size, in fact, from yeah, 0.2 hectares or more, tiny, tiny farms, up to farms of 5,000 to, to maybe 10,000 hectares, which are still very much managed as family units in, in uh, places in Australia or in, in Latin America. So or the US. Or the US, yeah, exactly. It's family farms. No, you're, you're, you're right. And, and I remember in one of your papers, actually, uh, you don't necessarily see an increase in the labor force across that huge uh, uh, scope of farm sizes because, of course, technology changes. I'm not right. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And so you have industrialization occurring, industrialization in the sense of corporate ownership of the enterprise with salaried workers and outside owners that occurring all around farming or crop farming, but never or rarely crop farming itself. Uh, yeah. So one of the astonishing things about agriculture is that you end up with, in say the cotton sector, um, a several thousand hectare cotton farm in the US competing directly with uh, one or two hectare cotton uh, farm in, in Mali or West Africa. They're selling roughly similar cotton to the same market. On the one hand, it's a millionaire cotton family farm in, in, in Mississippi in the US. And on the other hand, it's a very, very low income family farm in, uh, and they're also competing with Brazilians or others uh, growing with different farm sizes, different techniques. And as you think about the agronomy that each different type of farm needs, can you say a little more about what um what the uh what's at stake what are the main agronomic challenges opportunities what's exciting you about things we could do really well towards 2050 particularly about the sustainable development goal you know to meet sustainable development goals in the different countries of the world sure i mean maybe maybe just just before we move on to to sort of the intervention side i, I think it would be good maybe to try and unpack this this uh, concept of agroecology a bit, because I think agroecology is is used very differently in in some debates in Europe than it is in uh, on the other side of the big pond, uh, you know, in, in in the Americas. And um, one of the issues there is that agroecology by uh, in in Europe, there's a book by Joachim Sauborn from Hohenheim University who uses it in a very strict sense. Of, of really looking at the ecology of agriculture and the way that agriculture is tailored to ecological environments. Um, and yet in the new world, it's really very much um, tied up really with social movements, with the Via Campesina, the, the, the food sovereignty debates, um, very much the organic uh, agriculture sort of debates, I think, in particularly in Latin America. And, and I think that at times that's not particularly helpful because we'll be talking about agroecology and and people have completely different ideas about uh, uh, in their heads about what they're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And in some cases they're talking about very intensive approaches like permaculture. Sure. And it's very much about the agriculture of it, you know, small plot management and all that. And in other contexts they're talking about landscape scale yeah and you know if we're one of the examples that i like to use now if we try then to link that to types of technology is that um agroecology in in, in certainly in the latin american uh, definition would actually abhor the use of, of technologies like genetic engineering and yet i've argued that if that there are very good examples one here in the netherlands where uh, public funding uh, was used to actually develop resistance to potato blight. And of course, potato blight is one of these terrible diseases. You know, it caused the potato famine in Ireland in the past. It's a very plastic fungus which can evolve very quickly, so it's hard to breed against. And yet there's a GM solution now, a genetic engineered solution with three different resistance genes that can actually allow farmers to grow potatoes with hardly spraying fungicide. Whereas normally in the Netherlands, potatoes are sprayed up to 15 to 20 times a season 
to suppress phytophthora. Now that would argue then that the GM solution means we can reduce agrochemical use enormously, of, so reduce the use of, of toxic compounds in the environment. Now that for me is using the best of biology and that would be a form of an agroecological solution. But yeah. dog, in a sense, says, no, 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 we can't use that because GM's not good. And I wonder, well, why? Yeah. And do you feel like there are innovations in terminology that allow us to have the conversation move on from the polarized conflict into a more um, rich, empirical, informed discussion? Like in the United States, for example, we're moving from organic standards to talking about regenerative agriculture, just trying to find a new word, a new way of framing. In Europe, I mean, these are different debates to some degree happening in different parts of the world. I'm really curious in among the community you've talked with, what kinds of terminology is resonating and how can we get towards a better, more informed debate? Yeah, it's interesting. I just see on one of the comments that's come a reflection by Patch, Patch Mack, that agroecology is a deeply politicized term which relates more to worldview than to science. And I think in a sense, that's where, that's certainly where I was driving at in some of the, the chapter, that, that chapter that you read that I was writing, because, you know, really it becomes very dogmatic. Yeah, this is what, this is allowed and that's not allowed. And if we think, if we just take the GA debate again, and, and another example, you know, there are discussion in the United States about using now a, a triple stacked herbicide resistance, which would allow you to use three different herbicide chemicals to control weeds. And I'm thinking, ah, that, that, that hurts my brain. What a silly thing to do. It's just going to increase the problem when we can look at integrated solutions, so tillage mixed with moderate herbicide use to actually overcome the problem. So on the one hand, I'd argue for GM when we can reduce agrochemical use with those solutions using plant resistance. I'd argue against GM based on the wrong sort of trait, which is actually encouraging agrochemical use. And, and I think it's a matter of needing to take case by case the traits or the solutions or the problems we're looking at and what are the most appropriate ways of blending technology rather than saying, you know, uh, this is a good approach and that's a bad approach. Because I think then we're into the point that, that, Patrick, that Patch raises that we're into really more worldviews rather than actually using our knowledge to the best advantage. And, and, and yeah, we're, we're down to dogma and rule books and that simply doesn't work for me. Yeah. Although, of course, we do need some shorthand terms. We can't simply say every situation is unique and one needs evidence about every particular choice before deciding. We need some general framework to think about it. Are there kinds of frameworks that have been helpful to you? Well, I mean, I think, it, again, it's um, um, integrated <laughs> is uh -huh. often a, yeah, a, yeah. a word that comes out. So integrated approaches. And, and I think uh, so we've got integrated soil fertility management is an, an area that, we, that I would work with and would promote, which means we try and use all of the resources available efficiently. But we recognize that we need organic nutrient resources to manage soil organic matter and at the same time we need external inputs to balance the outputs so that we need moderate use of fertilizer efficient use of fertilizer i think that term integrated in uh, pest and disease management comes over very well it's it's not abhorring the use of, of chemicals chemical solutions because sometimes they're, they're needed but it's looking at trying to use them in the most effective way and to try to you know, do disease forecasting ways of, of uh, predicting things, but problems before they happen so that you can intervene early and you can prevent them from developing too much. So, um, but I, I don't like the idea of, you know, I think organic agriculture can be great for some people in some places, but it's not going to work everywhere probably. And and I think for me, it's, it's uh, I just don't feel good about dogma. So it's, it's sort of, needing to use our brains and knowledge and principles rather than saying i stand for this or i stand for that yeah. right right but because people do need 
shorthand terms mm. summarize and clarify, you know, that, that uh, the word integrated has been a go-to term, you know, with the ex example of integrated pest management and how that helped people to have a scientific program and also extension activities and dialogue with farmers about how to reduce rather than eliminate or destroy with with pesticide um, and integrated soil management integrated soil and water integrated agronomy sounds like a yes. nice uh framing as well yeah and i mean uh, i know working with some scientists in the us they, they were also talking about integrated weed management so using cover crops you know together with tillage together with herbicides but trying to minimize the, the, the chemical demand as well and and then you get around well so it's integrated weed management integrated pest and disease integrated nutrient and integrated production management um but i think it, it is in a sense you're working around a set of principles more about trying to use resources efficiently uh trying to uh prevent offside effects so so to target uh, uh towards the problem effectively and efficiently and and you're working really uh and and often the benefits there can often be economic for farmers in terms of economic efficiency because we're reducing inputs but at the same time they can sometimes be very demanding of knowledge and of labor or care and attention right and so well, they put more demands on the producer i think yeah yeah and one interesting limitation of the term integrated is a concern I would have that it leads people to imagine that the solutions are always a sort of average middle ground. Yeah. And I wonder to what extent it's helpful to just think of agriculture as actually very diverse, yeah. where in different regions, different countries, different parts of a country, there can be the coexistence of very different systems. So integrated doesn't always mean average. No, no, I think you're absolutely right. I'd 100% I'd, uh, go along with you there. I just uh, saw uh, uh, a comment here to, to tell me that, that Patch, uh, who is on the, the thread, is actually Patrick from the University of Leeds, You're working on uh, organic fertilizer from wastewater treatment. And he's asking, well, what makes a good fertilizer? Uh, is it helpful to say organic or mineral? Um, well, a good one because of course uh if we're talking about it as a fertilizer it's there to provide mineral nutrients but some are organic sources um and what makes a good fertilizer it's one well basically that pro provides the nutrients in the right uh proportions that are needed by a particular crop at a particular time uh in available way uh and actually when it comes to the management of nutrients, we can often find actually that mineral nutrients, nutrients from a bag, are easier to apply at the right time in the right dose than organic nutrients, because then we're having usually to put that on ahead of a crop before the crop's growing to turn it into the soil. You know, we can't often go in and put in sort of solid manure once the crop's already going. So organic uh, nutrients usually have to be managed in a different way. And, and so you can see that there are benefits of both. You know, one's good for building the soil organic matter, the other for providing plant nutrition. And we can actually manage those two goals, uh, I think, in a very useful way by, by not being too dogmatic and using the different sources towards their, their particular benefits. Yeah. yeah. And, and I would add certainly one concern in the US, I believe in Europe and increasingly throughout the developing world, especially densely populated countries in Asia, but even many parts of Africa is, our concerns are shifting increasingly towards the runoff and managing runoff and limiting runoff. Of course, plant uptake and plant productivity is crucial, but in the US at least, we've had a century of essentially no taxation of runoff, no concern about runoff. And suddenly now we have uh, an awakening, I think, around the idea that um, that soil management to limit runoff is a central task of agriculture. Absolutely. So, I mean, we, we sometimes frame this as uh, 
you know the the effluence of affluence yeah so so we we've, we've, we've had it too easy i think in northern european agriculture also in 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 the us fertilizer has been way too cheap in many ways uh, it's in 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 europe actually we deal with what people call the manure problem because of having intensive livestock and overproduction of manure in small areas, which needs becomes a disposal problem. Whereas if we go to places in Africa, where I have a lot of my work focused, we're really dealing with the completely other side of the coin, which is this problem of nutrient scarcity, where animal manure has become actually a really important resource for crop production. And of course, in the, the, the Gulf of Mexico, you have this dead zone, you know, which is created by all of the nutrients accumulatively washing down from the Mississippi into the, the Gulf of Mexico. And I think that really has to be a huge concern for the future of how you can actually modulate those, that, that leakage through leaching and runoff of, of nutrients, building up these nutrient loads in places that we simply don't want them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the commenters in our chat box uh, ca called out, called back to this term regenerative agriculture, sure. which has become popular in, in the US to some degree. And I'm curious about that term in your experience. It seems like very important kind of term, maybe especially in the African context, where for the first time now, the flow of animal manure is in very large volumes being returned to crops after having been lost in open grazing, mm -hmm. you know, centuries, um, my understanding is that broadly speaking, many, many parts of Africa are beginning to capture that and have an animal like crop livestock cycle much more under control. To what degree do you think soils in Africa are being regenerated? Unfortunately, <laughs> um, I mean, I think that the, We've worked around this a lot. It's been a big focus of work for us uh, because obviously we know that animal manures can be extremely important to, to build and keep soil fertility. But the uh, I think the big concern is that, that when we've done calculations, the amounts of animal manure available are simply not enough to go around. Uh, and we don't, you know, from the amount of grazing land that's available, uh, available for livestock, you can't keep enough livestock to keep all of the crop. Uh, area properly fertilized. So we do need inputs from outside as well. Although it's certainly true that within the systems, the animal manure that's there can, can often be used much more uh, efficiently. Yeah. I, I see that there's some other interesting points uh, popping up here. So one from uh, Philip Tamba, who's asking about how smallholder farmers can achieve um, better yields without uh, using agrochemicals to control pests and diseases. And this is, uh, is something actually that will come back again uh, later in the course when uh, Rebecca Nelson and Paul Jepson are going to discuss this new problem that broke out in, in Africa uh, over the past couple of years of the fall, fall army worm. But I'd just like to use this, uh, this, this, this point because I, I do think when we're talking agrochemicals, we need to make a, a, a big distinction between, for me, fertilizers, which if effectively used properly in the right place, they're not human toxins and, and, and they don't have this problem of, of the li links with negative human health unless they're there in, in huge extreme concentrations. Whereas we're dealing with pests and diseases are really controlled by chemicals which are highly toxic to people. And one of the big dangers there is if you don't have the best knowledge and the, to use them properly and appropriately, that they can be really highly toxic for, for individuals who are using them because they're using them without proper um, uh, proper protection and, and, and in ways that the, the human exposure to the, the, these things becomes much more, more, more dangerous. In, in our build-up for this, uh, uh, when we were discussing what, what we might talk about today, you mentioned this book of Charles Mann, The, the Wizard and the Prophet. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think it be, might be nice if maybe, Bill, if you could reflect a bit on, on the main story coming through his book. I, I, I found that very intriguing. 
Sure, yeah. So Charles Mann is a science journalist uh, who's been very successful in the United States and, and around the world documenting interesting aspects of agricultural and sort of civilizational history. Um, his most famous book was about the history of North America and how native populations were much larger than they had uh, previously thought to be um, and much more in some sense successful. And he turned his attention to the Green Revolution and agronomy and what happened in the 1950s and 60s and 70s when the modern debates were first uh, cemented. Um, and he, you know, I talked with him um, about four years ago about the sort of Green Revolution and he was saying, well, I'm thinking I might frame it around um, around uh, Norman Borlaug and the relationship between Borlaug and others. And the story he ended up telling in this book called The Wizard and the Prophet is thinking about Norman Borlaug and other people like Borlaug as wizards, people who are able to do magical things that no one else could do before. And other people who are prophets, meaning that they sort of foresee uh, a danger, see a limit, see a boundary. So in contemporary terms, that's um, Johann Rockström and planetary boundaries, or it's uh, others who would see um, an agroecological constraint on production, and they would argue for restraint to hold back, to not do the innovation for fear, for, for concern about the, the boundaries that you'd hit up against. So in this tension between the wizards who want to solve a problem and, and put in something new, and the prophets who say, stop, stop, uh, there's a great book that he tells about mm -hmm. individuals um, and their ambitions where we need both because if you just had wizards, you'd run into terrible um, environmental ecological constraints. Yeah, yeah. But if you just had profits, we would all be much restricted in what we could do, yeah, what we yeah. would be able, to, how many people we could have in our communities and so forth. So that's so, the framing so, that he... Yeah. So I, I, don't, I haven't read the I, book. I, I told you I'd actually bought several copies, but I ended up giving them away every time. So I, I need to, to read it. But, you know, if I think about Borlaug, I mean, of course, he, he Borlaug was credited really for, for two things, particularly. One was uh, breeding for, for resistant uh, of uh, wheat to rust, so, so really overcoming a, a, a terrible disease, which was wiping out uh, wheat. But then also for breeding wheat uh, to be short strawed and therefore that allowed then the use of nitrogen and it allowed, if you like, the, the, the green revolution in terms of the, a, a huge shift in, in crop yields because of the fact that then plants didn't fall over when they had too much nitrogen. So they could put more, much more nitrogen into grain. Now, you could argue, though, that those technologies were not necessarily dangerous or bad for the environment until they got into the wrong hands and got used wrong. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's clear that any sufficiently powerful solution to solve a problem is potentially powerful enough to be misused uh, or over um, extended. Um, and the prophet's role is to say, use it this way, not that way. Um, and with any luck, avoid throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Because if you were to stop all dwarfism or all dwarf, semi-dwarf varieties because you thought anybody would always misuse them, mm -hmm. is clearly to underestimate our capacity to regulate and manage in effective, regenerative, agroecological ways um, so in this dance between wizards and prophets, there's each successive generation of innovation, right? Where first you needed the rust resistance and then the semi-dwarfism and then the photoperiod insensitivity. So you could move genetic material around and, uh, and then 
the uh, arc plant architecture uh, in, 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 and, other, and, and then you have each successive generation of new uh, pests and pathogens evolving rapidly for the new host. Yeah, so, sure. and then, so. Sure. You know, we think of the experience of rice across Southeast Asia where the Green Revolution rices encountered because they were so agronomically successful but gave this relatively uniform genetic uh, population to be invaded by really cool. hoppers yeah. and so forth who could then decimate and so you had to race quickly to come up with a new so in a sense what we're often saying there i think is that we don't have among our scientists we're often not thinking far enough ahead to see some of those problems we often go out and and push our technologies and then we get hit by the next problem which we should have really foreseen if we've been thinking properly yeah it, it it it's great you know to this this sort of type of science and really trying to look at, at scenario testing for the future of what, what would work where and would not and trying to uh, to evaluate some of those problems before they happen i want to pick up on a couple of uh, things on the, the the discussion thread here uh, there are two comments one from wisdom donkor asking what can we do especially in the developing world to build capacities and i think that's a, an important question and that maybe coupling that to one where becky and tongo is saying this is a comment of what something i said earlier that organic agriculture might not work everywhere maybe give some examples where organic would not work now okay so now i'd like to qualify what I said and, and make sure that I didn't uh, say it, what I didn't mean. I think that organic agriculture uh, is highly useful for people who want to buy organic food, of course. I mean, that that it, it can create very much a, a value added for farmers because there are people who want to buy organic food, but it's often those who've uh, got uh, more purchasing power in their pockets, basically, who, who uh, who want to spend more on food because organic often tends to be more expensive. But um, I think organic, we can always produce for food organically, but I think it's more this question of can we really produce the quantities of food from the areas of land that are available to feed the larger population? Uh, and can we do that organically? And, and my answer there really would be from my own experience and the analyses we've done is, is that we can't actually produce sufficient food to feed the world if we were only to rely on organic agriculture. And I know that that's a, a contentious point, but certainly in the there, there are two things really. One is the difference in yield you can get per hectare, but also organic systems rely more on rotation, on the use of green manures, on other things that take time in the field. And it also means that the cropping intensity, the number of crops per year or over the years that you can get is actually reduced if you go over to purely organic systems. So I don't want to say organic agriculture is wrong because I think it's fine for the people who want to do it. But I do think it's wrong of people to say who only believe in organic agriculture that nobody can use other forms of agriculture. Because I think we have to allow choice and, and, and they are needed in different parts of the world. And Ken, on that topic, can you say something about the starting point? So I'm particularly interested in the question of to what degree is organic farming something that suits the patchwork of places that already have relative food abundance, relatively rich soils, strong uh, systems to integrate farmers with, uh, with consumers, as opposed to environments where soil organic matter levels are really low and cation exchange capacity is low and you need to build up the soil in order to even begin to have the moisture retention. Um, and so when you're in the Sahel, or in uh, South and East African settings where your soils are very sandy. Sure. So, Will, is there, is there yes. a patchwork here? Yeah. You're supposed to be the economist. No? 
I mean, you're just giving me this wonderful, <laughs> very erudite description of uh, some of the problems of of different environments in relation to soil. And I'm, you're, you're absolutely on, on the ball, I think. Um, I, th I think there are a couple of things. I mean, one is that, to be honest, even in areas where we've got, where we've good, good soils, good soil organic matter and the like, um, that you, if you were to stop using nitrogen fertilizers, our yields would, would drop by 40 to 50 percent because the soil can't simply supply sufficient uh, uh, amounts there. Usually because the in, in organic systems, they're often harvesting manure from larger areas of land than, than the farm themselves. So certainly in, in Europe, organic farms are often using manure, which comes from non-organic farms. Yeah? And, and not always, but that, that, that is the case. Certainly, if we're at a starting point where we're dealing with um, soils which are very sandy and, and, and have very, very low organic matter, it's extremely hard to get production up um, without uh, without using extra minerals. But you definitely do need uh, organic matter under those conditions. And I was looking at some, uh, some results this week where we've been working in Western Kenya on very good clay soils, where soils which have been really badly run down could actually be restored to productivity within one or two seasons with fertilizer, just with with inorganic nutrients coming from the bag. Now, we tried to do the same when I was working in Zimbabwe uh, in soils which have been very badly degraded due to overuse, which are very sandy. And even after 10 years of manure use, we couldn't get the, the, the yields back up. It was taking a very, very long time to recover. So I think there are soils like that, sandy soils, which are hard to manage where it takes a lot of investment to bring them back up to levels of productivity once they've been degraded. Whereas in soils which have got better physical properties, particularly, uh, now it's, easy, it's easier to rebuild uh, fertility just using nutrients from the bag because the soil structure itself is pretty good and it can provide the other things that a plant needs in terms of uh, the environment for growth. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious what you think of this question in the chat box from Mao Hernandez, uh, who asks, how do we make smallholder farmers and those without land of their own participate in intensification? Can we think of examples and describe situations where even the smallest farmers have been able to make best and better use of what they, what little they have? I mean, thanks to Mao very much for this question, because I think you really hit the nail on the head here in many ways. Um, if I'd say that the, air, the, the places where we've seen farmers really uh, participate in intensification strategies on, on very small farms are very often around uh, high value products. So I think uh, examples in Africa, in the African highlands uh, of uh, dairy farming would be good examples where very often you have uh, crossbred dairy cows being quite productive in terms of their milk production um, on very small farms, often being fed with uh, with grasses which are being like napier grasses, Venezuelan purple and elephant grass being produced as forage to feed them directly um, in a very intensive way, sometimes using concentrates, sometimes using agroforestry legumes uh, like the lupinas of this world. And but then on a small area of land, um, dairy can be fantastic because it provides regular income. You've got income more or less every day, not like with cropping where you only have income maybe once or twice a year. And I think that really offers an opportunity. Um, I think the other areas where you see intensification on very small farms are often around vegetable production. But unfortunately, smallholders often going far too far with the amounts of nutrients they're using and, and uh, with pest and disease control, using agrochemicals probably in a, in a very poor way. But where we don't see a lot of intensification happening spontaneously is with um, the production of staple food crops. And I think that's often very much to do with, with uh, 
the economics I'm now on your territory, so I have to be careful. That particularly that the price that people gave for, get for uh, producing maize is, is so relatively poor, it's not necessarily worth intensification. And I think also this, this issue of risk, risk of market in terms of not knowing what the price will be for the product, but also risk of, of climate, because if they invest in a bag of fertilizer and then the crop fails, then they're left with a debt. So, I mean, I guess risk is more your line, Will. Yeah, I mean, risk plays a big, a, a big role in that, and also uh, the ability of transportation systems to bring in, in the case of staple foods, the grains that are produced hundreds or thousands, uh, or even tens of thousands of kilometers away, where very large firm, very large farms, still family farms, but very large scale with modern technology are able to produce the same product at very, very low cost. Whereas a community, if it's going to have milk, if it's going to have vegetables, will often need to grow those locally. And they're very labor intensive. And so they're really in the wheelhouse of the carefully managed, intensively farmed small plot or small uh, farm for the, for the dairy case. Um, and so you have a natural path there for the smallholder uh, where relying on the outside world for staples is something that's very frightening for governments, yeah. um, but often has huge payoffs. If you can get your farmers into the higher value activities and let the Australia's, Brazil's, Argentina's um, sell you the grain, uh, you can often have a much faster path out of poverty because basic foods are cheap and the higher value, more labor intensive activities. But of course, governments are often very hesitant to do that. And, um, and for good reasons, because there are these periodic price spikes that are potentially politically extremely devastating. Um, mm, absolutely. And yeah. I think I think that idea of, of, of not knowing what the price is going to be when you harvest makes it really, really hard to know how to how to invest, doesn't it? Absolutely. I, th there's a great question here from Becky Nantongo, who's uh, talking about other ways of building organic matter and nitrogen using velvet beans, uh, tithonia jack beans, without necessarily using chemical fertilizers. Now, um, this is wonderful, Becky, because this is absolutely what I devoted my whole career to, basically, is uh, looking at the nitrogen-fixing legumes. Yeah, so. I think that the legumes are, are really a, a fantastic, aren't they? You know, we've got all of this nitrogen around us in the air, and yet crops can't use it except the legume crops. Now, we've worked extensively in many, many different parts of agriculture of Africa, um, looking at, at agroforestry trees and green manures for, for improving soil fertility. But what we found overall is that farmers uh, we've worked with in different communities, if we, if we offer them different legumes as choices, they're nearly always choosing the grain legumes. Yeah? So the groundnuts, the soybeans, the beans, the cowpea, because they want something which will improve their soil, but they want something that they can actually give them a direct product now. And it's often a reluctance under smallholder farmers to really invest in green manures, which might only pay them back in another season, because they're worried about the immediate, about the, their, their time horizon. It's often, I feel, very, very short. And of course, that, that affects perennial uh, legumes as well. Sure. You know, agroforestry techniques are also limited by that. Yeah. So the ones that the agroforestry that has really taken off very much has been with I think sometimes you've got these very big trees in parklands, like like the the, the Fiderbia albida, where you have the cropping underneath, and, and they basically are, are recycling within the system, but it allows you to do continuous cropping underneath, and and also the the trees which can be cut for forage, they they, they tend to be taken off. But I think the you know our experience with green manures has been that uh, um, if you look in history that the biggest use of green manures has actually been on large farms. Uh, but you, that was in the past 
certainly in the southern United States, in Georgia, they used to grow velvet beans in rotation with corn until soybeans came along, and then you could have two economic crops. And very much the same in, in southern Africa, in Zimbabwe. Uh, commercial farms, larger farms used green manures. But they tended to be replaced when you got <coughs> the legume-like soybean, which could come into the rotation system. Um, we did a, a meta-analysis recently of uh, all the data we could find of grain legumes in Africa. And we found that um, growing a, a, a legume instead of maize would give you an extra half a ton of maize the year after, at least, even under high nutrient conditions. So the real benefits of, of diversifying in, uh, uh, in rotations like that. Yeah. Uh, there's a comment from Patrick that legumes remain underutilized. And I'm really curious in the, in the world's farms, this absolutely resonates in the nutrition community where I'm working primarily now, where people are very, very interested in how to have food systems evolve where the demand for the protein and, and, and fat, the richer foods will be met by nutrients as opposed to meat, um, you know, met by leguminous grains. And I'm really curious, Ken, when you see the spread of soybeans across Africa, so soybeans spreading all across Ghana and elsewhere in West Africa, increasingly smallholder soybeans uh, succeeding in Southern Eastern Africa, to what extent do you see the future of legumes as involving soybeans, groundnuts, cowpeas, the sort of big three in some sense, and or all of the much smaller species, smaller in extent species of pigeon pea, lentils of various kinds, and so forth. And then thinking about the various bean uh, types of beans, how do you see the mix of species, right? So cereal grains, certain species just dominate. Yeah. Um, where there had been much greater variety, now a few blockbuster species of cereal grains dominate. What's the future of variety within the leguminous grain universe? Yeah, no, really good question. I mean, soybean, as it's taking off, uh, the, the expansion of soybean is really being driven by the urban demand for chicken. And the fact that soybean and maize mixed uh, make a very, very good uh, uh, animal feed. And the the problem that we we, invis we 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 actually encounter with with the expansion of soybean production in in Africa really is the importation of very cheap cake from Latin America. When prices were buoyant, actually uh, farmers in Africa were doing really well with soybean. The last year, prices got really depressed, and all of a sudden there was a flood of a very cheap uh, soybean cake, which has actually started to destroy some of the embryonic markets that we had internally for, for soybean in, in West Africa. Interestingly, I mean, beans, so the common bean, Fasciolus beans, are very much the dominant uh, food legume in East Africa and also uh, into Southern Africa, basically, because they taste nice, of course. They, I mean, they're, they're, they're the best um, legume in terms of, 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 of uh, food and very much preferred particularly some varieties very much preferred in, in East Africa. When we come to pigeon pea, pigeon pea is actually really an export crop for Africa. It's very much uh, grown for export to India, and India being this insatiable market really for legumes, um, pigeon pea, chickpea, grown in Ethiopia. And unfortunately last year, uh, again, issues of trade, Last year, uh, there was a bumper crop of pigeon pea in India, and the Indian government at one point actually stopped all import because of trying to protect their own market. And that left a lot of farmers and, and grain traders in Africa with a huge volume of pigeon pea that they couldn't dispose of because of them suddenly being denied the Indian market. I know that we got production in the order of 35,000 tons out of Mozambique, much more out of Tanzania. And and this led to a, a huge problem, actually, of what was a very, uh, very positive market, if you like, for, uh, for East Africa. So sometimes government intervention like that can be great for protecting their own farmers, but can have some really nasty repercussions elsewhere. 
unfortunately in Africa, people don't really seem to like eating pigeon pea nuts. Uh, it's a great crop to mix with maize. It puts a lot of nitrogen into the soil for maize and, and, and into crops, but um, it doesn't really seem to take off particularly as a, as a food that, that people eat a lot. Whereas in India, of course, it's very much part of the diet in, in the Tour of Dal, the yellow dals, uh, which is eaten in nearly every meal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a real cautionary lesson about uh, putting too much into any one market, um, yeah, depending on just one government. Of course, India is very diverse, and, and uh, but they do have one single trade policy. And if they decide to use that and you're trying to sell into India, um, so crops that have a more diversified markets are much more stable. Mm. Maybe, maybe I can ask you, Will, uh, a, a question on this, because I, I actually had the privilege to sit with the Minister of Agriculture in Ethiopia uh, uh, a, a couple of months back. And we have a project called End to Africa, which is very much looking at, at boosting uh, production of grain legumes in Africa. When I was talking to the minister, I mean, his concern, whereas I thought it would be very much around the food security in the country, his concern was very much about export and, and looking at legumes for export, because, of course, his job is also to, uh, as Minister of Agriculture, is to look at the balance of payments. And, and it seems to me almost there's a sort of a conundrum there that, that you have to produce for export because you need the imports of oil and everything to drive the economy. And at the same time, it's a country which is struggles at times with its own food security. Yeah, and I think that the the countries that have succeeded are the countries that do both, uh, because they recognize that both exports and local food security are driven basically by getting the production and marketing systems moving in in both directions, often a complement. You know, when you have the farmer organizations, the marketing infrastructure for um, bulking up and transporting both what you're bringing into the rural areas and what you're shipping out of the rural areas. What you find is that both the local food crop for local consumption and the, the export product, they use the same road, they use the same uh, institutions, and there'll be different uh, seeds, there'll be perhaps different fertilizer formulations and different, um, of course, different different end users, but the same agricultural development strata, big failings is where governments have tried to put too big a bet on just one. And it's like trying to have a, a stool with just you know one or two legs and it's just not stable. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so essentially uh, growing crops which are both staple crops and can be exported is potentially a good way of managing that sort of risk? Or, Not necessarily or the same crop. Integrate uh, well, different crops in the uh, same yeah. system. Exactly. Often the places that do best with cotton also have the best performance in producing a cereal. Um, sometimes the same farms, sometimes different farms, sometimes the same village, sometimes different vi uh, geographically separated um, locations, but the shared commitment to supporting smallholder farmers, providing the rural infrastructure and education uh, that, that, that they need to succeed in general, um, and developing the research and extension system that makes a pipeline of innovation, whether that's agronomic management, crop genetics, where that's important, and crop protection um, through all the integrated strategies that the latest research can offer um, yeah. the way that the, the you know where the farmers themselves may be uh, at extremely low levels of income, extremely low levels of education, and yet have the the labor, the land, the energy, the excitement, the effort uh, that you know no no one can do it alone. Um, and the idea that you could have just the export sector without the food crops is has not been the case, has, has not been a recipe for success in the past. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are more questions, well, questions from, uh, about, uh, from Patrick about forage legumes in Africa, whereas in Europe, and, and this is also certainly in, in uh, 
in organic agriculture in Europe, it relies very much on clover, on white clover uh, in grasslands to actually build fertility, which is then potentially harvested during um, rotation with, with uh, arable crops. And so grown both for forage and green manure. What about tropical forages? Well, I mean, th there's a huge amount of research been done on tropical forages, and there are very many uh, different species which are well known, which grow very well. But they've tended only really to be adopted in, in systems where livestock uh, is being used intensively for markets, because that they, they're quite difficult to establish, and they take quite a lot of effort to get them uh, to get them growing and it's usually only where either farmers are producing milk for the market or uh, trying to fatten uh, goats or, or cattle for uh, a, a meat market that, that farmers really invest in in forages although we could see at farm level they could actually be a very good source of bringing nutrients uh, uh, particularly nitrogen into into the system yeah i think we have just We're a couple more minutes, yeah. Close to time. So where does this all leave us with industrial agriculture or agroecological? Uh, what would your take be, uh, Bill? Uh, well, I would say from an economics point of view, you need both. If you don't have agribusinesses delivering a sufficient supply of nutrients and crop chemicals when you need them, certainly the veterinary medicine and the veterinary uh, care that a livestock sector needs in order to provide that function to the crop sector, as well as the animal source foods that people want uh, directly for nutrition. And as long as you don't, so, so on the one hand, you need that agricultural, agribusiness and, and agro-industrial sector to do its thing well with the appropriate regulation and um, and, uh, and, and constraint, because if left unchecked, it would devour uh, all the universe around it. At the same time, you need to be managing natural resources in a agroecological way. And if you neglect that, whether that's the, um, the relative dominance of different species in soil microbes and aquatic microbial life, as well as uh, every other kind of ecological balance. Mm. Um, so it's, it's a little hard to see it as a contradiction when they're both needed in different parts of the world and different parts of the system. That's how I perceive it. Sure. I mean, I think from my side, um, I really do believe that, that your farmers as custodians of the land recognize very much that they need to maintain the productivity of their soils. I think they're sometimes cast as the, the, the as the devil, you know, who are, who are destroying the environment. And I don't know, I know, never really met a farmer who didn't really care deeply about their land and about the future of their land. Um, so I, I think as custodians of the land, it really is our job, if you like, from the science side to try and look at where are the ways that we can use the best of our knowledge to actually support farmers. And, and, and for me, that really means using all of the different approaches that are available but in a, in a way, we, we, we keep an open mind and we try not to shut any particular doors. Yeah? So, so that would be my plea, really, is you know, let, let's leave the door open for, for a multitude of different approaches and not try and tell everybody, you know, you're wrong because you believe this. You know? We've got to keep our, our hearts and our worldviews sometimes a bit more suppressed. I think yeah. it's uh, great talking to you today, uh, Will. Uh, been very enjoyable, and uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it as well. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks very much, everybody.